Today, we are so excited to host our second webinar in our Science and Social Justice series, History Reconsidered, featuring Dr. Clint Smith. Dr. Clint Smith is a staff writer at The Atlantic and author of the poetry collection, Counting Descent, which won the award for best poetry collection from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association and was a finalist for an NAACP Image Award. He is also the author of the forthcoming nonfiction book, How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America, uh, published by Little Brown, uh, and which will be released uh, July 2021, correct? June 2021. June 2021, excuse Available me. Available for pre-order as, as of today. Oh, as of today. Oh, that's very, very exciting. Uh, <laughs> and his writing has been published in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Poetry Magazine, The Paris Review, and elsewhere. Uh, Clint received his bachelor's from Davidson College and a PhD from Harvard University. We are so excited and so, uh, so just very, very happy to, to host you and to feature you, uh, Dr. Clint Smith, as our speaker for this webinar. I appreciate it. It's, uh, I'm excited to be here and, and look forward to talking with you all and, and getting the Q&A after going as well. Absolutely. So yeah, I guess we can now transition and uh, Clint, uh, the stage is now yours. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. Um, I know there's a lot going on um, these days in the context of this pandemic world that we're in, um, but I am grateful for all of you for taking the time. Um, and I hope that the next uh, 45 minutes or so of your evening will be will be generative. And, and mostly I hope that it can serve as a, uh, as a catalyst for conversation that we can have um, toward the end. And so uh, typically, this is, you know, this is not a traditional talk. I don't have any slides I'm gonna show you. I don't have any, um, I'm not gonna just lecture at you for the next 35 minutes. Uh, instead, I sort of give a presentation that's sort of anchored and punctuated with poems throughout. I'm a poet, I'm a writer. Um, it feels very natural to how I um, tell the story about the history of this country um, to include um, a different sort of mechanism that might serve as a helpful entry point for us thinking about this. And so broadly, we're gonna be thinking about the history of uh, inequality in this country because we're, we are in a, what's perhaps the largest racial, largest and most sustained racial reckoning in this country since the 1960s. Um, and the extent to which it will continue to sustain itself uh, and manifest itself in different uh, corners of our society um, depends on not only people deciding that we have to have, you know, there are all these always these moments, something happens in the country, something happens in the workplace, something happens in your school where you say, we have to have this conversation about race and racism and diversity and inclusion, but not often enough are we grounding those conversations in the histories from which they emerge. Um, and part of what I wanna do for you this evening is try to give you a sense for you, for you both for you and your pedagogy and for your students, um, a sense of the uh, sort of historiography of inequality, if you will, and specifically the historiography of anti-Black racism and, and the impact that it has on our current contemporary landscape of inequality. And as a result, the impact that it has on our students, whether they're Black, White, Asian, or Latinx, um, all of that history shapes what the current history looks like today. But I'm trained as a sociologist. I should also say, um, because we are in our, our Zoom, Zoom lives, that it is quite possible, like right now, that you might hear my two children outside the door. Um, they are, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and so um, they are delightful and they are loud. Um, and so they don't care if dad is on a Zoom call, uh, but they, um, you might hear them laughing, you might hear them crying, you might hear them knocking on the door. Um, hopefully if you're watching with your toddler, they can, um, you can uh, understand what uh, the situation we find ourselves in. So I'm trained, as I was saying, I'm trained as a sociologist. Um, I was trained on a sociologist. And so it's impossible for me to have this conversation without grounding myself um, and, and thinking about my own positionality, as we call it, within the context of the subject matter that we're discussing. Um, and so for me, you know, if we're having a conversation about the history of white supremacy, the history of racism, it's important for me to think about the ways that that, that has enacted itself in the context of my own life. Um, so for context, I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, very mixed mixed race, mixed income community. I had black friends, white friends, Asian friends. It was like the Disney Channel. It was great. We were riding our bikes, theme music playing in the background. Our hair was blowing in the wind. It's clearly their hair, not my hair. Uh, and my dad would always say, he's like, I love that you have such a diverse group of friends. That's why we sent you to the school. That's why we moved to this neighborhood. But you have to understand that the implications for the decisions that you make 
might be very different for you than they are for your other friends. And when you're a kid, you don't really understand that. When you're a kid, you're just like, you're the mean dad, you're the strict dad. Why can't you be more like Tommy's dad? And he's like, Tommy don't live in this house. And then he walks away very dramatically because he's watched far too many Denzel Washington movies, which is a, a thing for another conversation in the future. Um, but I, I always remember when Tamir Rice was killed. Now, Tamir Rice, as many of us know, the 12 year old boy who was killed in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, about five years ago now, shot while playing with a toy gun in a park in an open carry state. Police shot him within two seconds of them pulling up to the scene, talked about how big he looked, how, how much of a man he looked like, um, almost as if he were Hulk, like, uh, but he was 12 years old. And what it represents is uh, the very real sociological phenomenon of the process of adultification that black children experience um, relative to their white counterparts. And this idea that black children, both boys and girls are seen as being older um, than they actually are and, and the sort of implications and ramifications that that has for them um, socially in the world um, often means that they are perceived as more of a threat in the context of a sort of larger systemically racist country. And I think about that and I think about watching the interview with Tamir Rice's mother who was talking about the warnings that she gave him, how careful she told him to be, and how this was the sort of the worst and most fatalistic manifestation of her fear. And I think about the conversation that my own parents have with me, and I think about the sort of intergenerational nature of that talk that Black parents and Black teachers often have with their children or their students. And I think about how my grandfather had a certain conversation with my father, and my father had a certain conversation with me, and that I will one day have to have a conversation with my own son right now, who, you know, who's right now three years old and loves pineapple pizza and Ritz crackers and you know telling everybody how much he loves the Pachycephalosaurus and it's his favorite dinosaur. Uh, these dinosaurs I didn't know existed until four months ago. Um, but it is a reminder that you know when we walk through the grocery store or the park and people are like, oh, he's so cute, he's so adorable, um, that that ends for him much earlier than it might for, for his, some of his friends. Um, and how do you communicate to a young person the realities of the world while also not falling into the trap of making them think they have done something to deserve those realities without making them think that they, um, as James Baldwin writes in his 1963 essay, A Talk to Teachers, the job of the educator is to make it so that the student understands that they are not the criminal as much as society makes it seem as if or inundates them with messages that suggest that they are criminal or part of a criminal community. What we have to do as educators is help young people understand that it is actually the society that has created the conditions in which these young people grow up that is the criminal, right? It is the system, is the structure that should be indicted, not the young person. Um, and part of what happens if you don't understand the history of racism is that you can fall into the trap of thinking that the reason one community looks one way and another part of another community looks one another way, or one school looks one way and another school looks another way, is because of the people or the students or the parents in those communities rather than things that have been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but I wanna sort of ground myself interpersonally um, in the context of the history. And so this is a poem that I wrote after Tamir Rice was, uh, was killed. What I should also say is that we were, if we were in person, if we were in the, the before times um, and we were all together, what I would have us do is like, if you like something, typically when people go to a poetry reading, we think you're supposed to sit there and be polite and just be like, Hmm. Hmm. And then do a polite little golf clap at the end. That's whack. We don't do that here. That's no fun. If you like something, let me, I want to hear you snap. I actually can't hear you, but I would tell you to snap. If you really, really like something, I would say do the delicious chocolate noise. That's when you go, hmm, like chocolate stuck at the top of your mouth. If you really, really like something, we see you do Jesus, but with a shove, because this is a secular space. So it's like Jesus, and you fall over the person next to you. But it's pandemic season. Don't fall over the person next to you. This is a, you know, we're in a, if you're in your bubble, you can fall on your dog, your husband, your wife, your partner, your toddler, your kids, whatever, um, but social distance. So don't fall on people that don't wanna be falling on. But we don't have any of that. I can't see you, I can't hear you, but there is a chat. You can use the chat. Look, Will, Will's on top of it. Shout out to Will Middlebrooks, snaps in chat. You can do that. The chat is our new space where we will be with one another, engage with one another and pretend as if we're not uh, all stuck at home. Um, so here we go. One night when I was 12 years old, on an overnight field trip to another city, my friends and I bought super soakers. 
turn the hotel parking lot into our own water-filled battle zone. We hid behind cars, running through the darkness that lay between the streetlights, boundless laughter ubiquitous across the pavement. But within 10 minutes, my father came outside, grabbed me by my forearm and led me into our room with an unfamiliar grip. Before I could say anything, tell him how foolish him he looked in front of my friends, he derided me for being so naive, looked me in the eye, fear consuming his face, and said, son, I'm sorry, but you can't act the same as your white friends. You can't pretend to shoot guns. You can't run around in the dark. You can't hide behind anything other than your own teeth. I know now how scared he must have been, how easily I could have fallen into the empty of the night, that some man would mistake this water for a good reason to wash all of this away. These are the sorts of messages I was inundated with my entire life. Always keep your hands where they can see them. Don't move too quickly. Take off your hood when the sun goes down. My parents raised me and my siblings in an armor of advice, an ocean of alarm bells so someone wouldn't steal the breath from our lungs so that they wouldn't make a memory of this skin so we could be kids, not casket or concrete. And it's not because they thought it would make us better than anyone else. It's simply because they wanted to keep us alive. All of my black friends were raised with the same message, the talk given to us when we became old enough to be mistaken for a nail ready to be hammered to the ground when people made our melanin synonymous with something to be feared. But what does it do to a child to grow up knowing that you cannot simply be a child, that the whims of adolescence are too dangerous for your breath? You cannot simply be curious. You are not afforded the luxury of making a mistake that someone's implicit bias might be the reason you don't wake up in the morning. But this cannot be what defines us, because we had parents who raised us to understand that our bodies weren't meant for the backside of a bullet, but for flying kites and jumping rope and laughing until our stomachs burst. We had teachers who taught us how to raise our hands in class and not just to signal surrender, and that the only thing we should give up is the idea that we aren't worthy of this world. So when we say that Black lives matter, it's not because others don't, it's simply because we must affirm that we are worthy of existing without fear. When there are so many things that tell us we are not. I want to live in a world where my son will not be presumed guilty the moment he is born, where a toy in his hand isn't mistaken for anything other than a toy. And I refuse to accept that we can't build this world into something new, some place where a child's name doesn't have to be written on a t-shirt or a tombstone, where the value of someone's life isn't determined by anything other than the fact that they had lungs. A place where every single one of us can breathe. So, when we're thinking about these things, um, it's really important, again, to sort of put this in historical context, right? It is not enough to say, um, this thing happened, we have to understand it. George Floyd happened, Breonna Taylor happened, Ahmaud Arbery happened. Um, there's a, a man who was killed yesterday in Philadelphia or the day before yesterday in Philadelphia, right? This is incessant, this continues to happen in, you know, if not always in the context of police violence, but in all sorts of both interpersonal systemic violences um, that enact themselves in the communities of our young people and also in the, in the schools of our young people, which is why as educators, we have to be equipped to think, uh, to be thoughtful uh, and purposeful about how we uh, navigate these issues in our, in our classrooms. And so what I always try to do is give people this timeline because I think it's helpful in sort of grounding the conversation, but the first enslaved people were brought to the, the British colonies that would become the United States in 1619. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863 Civil War ended in 1865. Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act were signed in 1964 and 1965. The Federal Housing Act was signed in 1968. So it's only been about 50 years in which Black people in this country have even had a semblance of legal and legislative freedom. For 350 years prior to that, it was fundamentally legal to discriminate against, dehumanize, delegitimize, and disenfranchise Black people. Not in an interpersonal somebody being mean and using a racial slur, but like you are a state sanctioned second class citizen if you were considered a citizen at all. So if you were to kick somebody for 350 years and then ostensibly stop kicking them for a seventh of the amount of time that you spent kicking them, it'd be both morally and intellectually disingenuous to then look at that group of people and be like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have the same educational outcomes? Why don't you have the same economic outcomes? Why is there so much violence and poverty in your community when we know the answers to these questions, right? I spent the last uh, year, uh, three years of my life um, working on a book uh, that Ralph mentioned when, the, when Affirmative Action was white, or excuse me, that is a book I read. That's not the book I wrote. Um, the book, uh, How the Word is Passed. Look at me, I can't even get the name of my book right. I blame it on COVID brain and dad brain. That's the combination that's throwing me off. 
How the Word is Passed is the name of my book. Um, and in it, I go to different historical sites across the country and think about how they reckon with or fail to reckon with their relationship to the history of slavery. And so I've been thinking about this history for a long time. And slavery is one of those things where people are like, oh, like, you know, as a science teacher, like, is that relevant to my pedagogy as a, you know, even as a person, as a citizen, like, I know slavery was bad, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, I saw 12 years a slave, like, you know, I get it, it was a terrible thing, but what does it really have to do with right now? And we don't reckon with the fact that as David Blight, the Yale historian writes that in 1860, the 4 million enslaved black people were worth more than every bank, factory, and railroad combined. The single greatest catalyst of wealth that this country has ever known were the bodies of enslaved people, right? And I think about how recent this history was and relative to um, the rest of the world. I always think about a trip I took to England uh, a few years ago and I was on a tour at Oxford University and the tour guide was showing us all these different buildings. It was like this famous poet lived in there, this famous philosopher lived there, this famous scientist lived there, um, you know, all the people who went to this prestigious university. And he looked at one building and he looked at the building, he looked at us, he looked at the building, he looked at us. And he was like, this building was built around 1020. And in my mind, I was like, AM or PM, right? Like I couldn't even conceptualize the idea that a building that was still standing and functioning had been built a millennium ago, right? But what it reminds me of is that the US's history is so recent. It is, we are so young. We are just like the annoying preteen of the world, increasingly so, right? And so this idea that this institution that lasted 250 years and is only not lasted in this country for 150 years, it lasted 100 years, a century longer than it is not in the United States or the British colonies that would become the United States. The idea that that would have nothing to do with what the contemporary landscape of inequality looks like. The idea that the fact that my grandfather's grandfather was born a slave, right? That like when my child sits on my grandfather's lap, when my three-year-old sits on my grandfather's lap, and I imagine my grandfather sitting on his grandfather's lap, it sort of flattens and, and just um, reminds me that of the sort of temporal and psychological and emotional proximity we have to that period of time. And the idea that we would suggest, you know, that that has nothing to do with what our country looks like, with what our schools look like, um, is again, morally and intellectually disingenuous. And one of the places I go in this book, as I'm trying to answer the questions about what is the relationship of that history to where we are now, is Monticello Plantation. So Monticello, for those who don't know, where Thomas Jefferson lived. And Thomas Jefferson, you know, what I was taught in my American history classes, was the, uh, you know, the intellectual founding father of this country. He represents the best of our American ideals, the best of our sort of philosophical aspirations. He was the person who um, wrote the Declaration of Independence, helped Madison write the Constitution. Um, and I didn't learn, but I didn't learn until many years later when I read his uh, book, Notes on the State of Virginia, his sort of memoir or manifesto of sorts. And in it, he writes very specifically and, and sort of not even, you know, puts his feet into the water of, of pseudoscience and eugenics, but, but is pretty explicit in theorizing around it. He says the slave is incapable of, uh, or that black people are inherently inferior to white people, both in endowments of body and mind, right? A sort of like pseudoscience, textbook pseudoscience um, sentiment. They're inferior in, in quote, endowments of body and mind, that the slave is incapable of love and thus incapable of possessing or sustaining complex emotion. He writes about Phyllis Wheatley, who was considered to be the first published po poet in the history of the United States, or the first published black poet, rather, in the history of the United States. He's like, well, you know, black people don't know, they don't have the emotional capacity to love, and love is necessary to be a poet. And so Phyllis Wheatley, we, we shouldn't call her a poet. Her work is, quote, beneath the dignity of criticism, essentially saying we shouldn't even engage with it on that front because Black people and, and enslaved people don't possess the emotional or intellectual or artistic capacity with which to create beautiful things. And I think about that, and I think about how that's a version of Jefferson that I was never taught. And I think about how Jefferson is a microcosm of the way that we tell the story of American history in which we are so committed to the idea of American exceptionalism that we end up suppressing and pushing down the stories that make us look unexceptional. And we don't reckon with the fact that Jefferson might have been a brilliant man and that he is a deeply racist man. That he is someone who uh, wrote one of the most important documents in the history of, of the world in the Declaration of Independence. And that he is someone who enslaved over 600 people over the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children that he had by an enslaved woman, Sally Hemings on his plantation, right? 
and what does it mean for us to hold both of those truths at once? And what I posit, you know, so often in the context of education, people are like, oh, you start talking about that, it, it like you're inundating, you know, or indoctrinating students with your politics, or what does this have to do with, you know, you might wonder, what does this have to do with science or, you know, what is this? But, but if we don't consider the ways that the, the people who, whose work and whose ideas represent the intellectual pillars upon which the American project was founded, if we don't understand the pseudoscience embedded within the sort of arguments that they were making, then we don't necessarily prepare our students to identify the way that the current iterations of those pseudosciences manifest themselves today. Because there are different and more subtle iterations of that that continue um, to be propagated you know, across, the, across the country um, and across the world, right? And there's a long history of, of important philosophers and important scientists and important thinkers who have trafficked in you know, the worst of, of pseudoscience. When we talk about Humes, when we talk about Hegel, when we talk about um, you know, some of Voltaire, when we talk about the people who uh, were some of the, the foremost thinkers of um, the, the Enlightenment, right? The scientific revolution. Um, those are the same people who also said horrific things about black people and believed that they were incapable um, of being fully human. And I think that as, as, you know, whether you're a science teacher or whether, or even if it doesn't fit itself into your pedagogy directly, it is important to keep, uh, to be thinking about, it's important to keep in mind because I think it animates what our teaching looks like and it animates the sort of ways that we uh, consider the no very notion of objectivity and what like objective science means and like how do we teach the history of science without also being honest about where the history of science is emerging from. Right, because if we're if we're gonna just pretend like all these folks who were you know part of the Enlightenment and part of the scientific revolution were um, you know the these these people who were just neutral parties, but who also weren't you know so many of these folks they were scientists, but they were also philosophers and they were also government officials and they were also people who were instituting policy that impacted people's lives across the world in the context of colonialism, imperialism, um, and and enslavement. Uh, you know in the uh, across the Western world. And, and I think it's important to be considering those things. So you can tell that I'm really interested in the founding fathers. Um, and I think they're a great entry point to thinking about a lot of these issues. Um, this poem is about the founding fathers who owned enslaved people, which was uh, 12 of our first 18 presidents owned enslaved people, eight of them owned slaves while they were in office. And this is a letter to five of them. Letter to five of the presidents who owned slaves while they were in office. George Washington, when you won the revolution, how many of your soldiers did you send from the battlefield to the cotton field? How many had to trade in their rifles for plows? Can you blame the slaves who ran away to fight for the British? Because at least the Redcoats were honest about their oppression, Thomas Jefferson. When you told Sally Hemings that you would free her children if she remained your mistress, did you think there was honor in your ultimatum? Did you think we wouldn't be able to recognize the assault in your signature as raping your slave when you disguise it as bribery, make it less of a crime? When you wrote the Declaration of Independence, did you ever intend for black people to have freedom over their bodies, James Madison? When you wrote to Congress that black people should count as three fifths of a person, how long did you have to look at your slaves to figure out the math? Was it easy to chop them up? Do you think they'd be happy being more than just half human James Monroe? When you proposed sending slaves back to Africa, did black bodies feel like rented tools? When you branded them, did the scar on their chest include an expiration date? When you named the country Liberia, were you trying to be ironic? Does this really count as liberation Andrew Jackson? Was the Trail of Tears not enough for you? Was killing Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, Seminoles not enough to quench your imperialism? How many brown bodies do you have to bulldoze before you can call it progress, Mr. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Jackson, when you put your hand on the Bible and swore to protect this country, let's be honest in who you were talking about. When the first Independence Day fireworks set the sky aflame, don't forget where we were watching from. So when you remember Jefferson's genius, don't forget the slaves who built the bookshelves in his library. When you remember Jackson's victories in war, don't forget what he was fighting to preserve. When you sing that this country was founded on freedom, don't forget the duet of shackles dragging against the ground my entire life. I've taught been taught how perfect this country was. But no one ever told me about the pages torn out of my textbooks, how black and brown bodies have been bludgeoned for three centuries and find no place in the curriculum. 
Oppression doesn't disappear just because you decided not to teach us that chapter. If you only hear one side of the story, at some point you have to question who the writer is. Um, and so, you know, I can go on and on about the, the history of slavery um, because it's well, mostly what I've been thinking about the last three years writing this book. But I think it's also important for us not to fall into the trap of thinking uh, that it is only that period of time that has shaped what the, again, the contemporary landscape of inequality look like. I think intuitively people know that. People are like, oh, Jim Crow, Jim Crow is bad, you know. Um, I've almost tried to stop using the language of Jim Crow because I think it doesn't have enough teeth to like actually capture what the period of time was. I, I, if I say it, I try to say Jim Crow apartheid um, because what we had was state sanctioned apartheid in this country until at least 1968. I mean, there are arguments to be made for the continuous manifestations of um, oppression that explicit and in, implicit that exist against black people today. Um, but you know, what, it's also important to think about all that's happened in quote unquote race neutral context throughout the 20th century. Um, so, you know, think something I think about all the time, um, and I'm kind of an, an evangelist about it, is the New Deal. You know, the New Deal, I was taught in my American history classes was the uh, great catalyst of intergenerational wealth throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. It is responsible for uh, helping to create the contemporary middle class. It is the thing that millions and millions of Americans use to um, lift themselves up or to be lifted up or lift themselves up um, into into homes, into intergenerational wealth, into college degrees, into the suburbs, into the ostensible American dream. And what I didn't learn until many years later when I read a book um, by a historian and political scientist, Ira Cass Nelson, When Affirmative Action Was White, which is the name what I call my own book, but that's um, When Affirmative Action Was White and another book called Fear Itself, which, do I have it here? It would be great if I said that and then I could just pull it off the shelf. It's, it's around here somewhere. Um, but they were incredibly formative for me. Um, and a thing that I do, you know, I just graduated with my PhD in May. Um, and a thing that I did for six years, you know, my idea of a good time on a Friday night uh, is to, uh, and Ralph can tell you, like, you know, go to the, li the basement of the library um, with a bag of hot Cheetos and read a 700 page book on inequality. Like that's, that's a, good, a good idea of a good time for me. Um, and while I recognize that that's not everybody's idea of a good time, uh, I, I'm always thinking about what are the ways that I can take the essence of the ideas that I'm sitting with and thinking about and translate them into ways that uh, can be conveyed and communicated to folks who might not have the time, the space, the resources, the social, cultural, or economic capital with which to, to sit and, and read these things that have been really formative and, and, tra and transformative for me. Um, and so that's a long way of saying that I read books and then write poems about them. Um, and this is one of those poems thinking about uh, the New Deal, uh, because what I didn't, what I, I didn't continue to explain, what I learned is that the New Deal uh, systemically left Black people from accessing the majority of its benefits. So Black people didn't have access to Social Security, minimum wage protection, housing mortgages, health care, GI Bill, minimum um, union membership, right? So all of the economic bedrocks upon which a century of intergenerational wealth was built, you very intentionally give it to one group of people. And then you very intentionally don't give another to another group of people and they did it so that black people in the south wouldn't get it which is where the majority of black people were in the early 20th century and you you give it to one group and don't give it to another group and people want to act surprised generations later when there are disparate outcomes along the lines that these resources have been allotted right like but the contemporary landscape of inequality should not come as a surprise to anyone who understands the very intentional mechanisms by which public policy created uh, economic investment in cer certain communities and economic disinvestment in other communities, and not even investment and disinvestment, but literally lifted some people up at the expense of others. And I think that that goes to the sort of, you know, when we tell the story about America to our students, this idea, you know, some people are like, oh, it's anti-American, or you're telling, you know, America is a place that has created unparalleled opportunities for millions and millions of people. It is also a place that has created those opportunities at the expense of millions and millions of other people. And both of those things are the story of this country. And you have to tell that complex, complicated, but ultimately accurate and tangled story. And I would argue that that is a much more um, intellectually rigorous thing to demand of our students, right? To say, 
you know, instead of saying like Jefferson was great and, you know, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, University of Virginia, da da da, or, you know, New Deal, you know, lifted all these people into the middle class, homes in the suburbs, cars, the American dream. Instead, it is, I would argue, it, it, you know, you can be both culturally responsive, you can be both anti racist, you can uh, have a sort of classroom that is predicated on critical pedagogy and, and interrogate and critical thought that in its essence and in doing so demands a different level of intellectual rigor from your students because it is demanding and asking them to hold what otherwise feel like contradictory realities at once. And just to say like, these are both the stories of this country. And it's important for you to understand all the different iterations. I mean, I've just given you a couple, but like, I mean, this is the case throughout, you know, our, our history as a country and even before that when we were a colony, right? And this is the history of the world. You know, if we we're gonna talk about immigration, it would be the same thing, you know, like immigration is something millions of people come to this country to try to get access to a better life. But like, if we're not also talking about the fact that the US, the history of US imperialism and the history of US colonialism and the history of US uh, created climate change, which disproportionately impacts people in certain regions, if we don't talk about th how those realities have, um, have really uh, destabilized the sort of political and economic realities of certain countries, then we aren't telling a full story about the history of immigration, right? And so, and this is in the context of social studies, this is in the context of science, this is like all of this, it is not subject specific. There are all sorts of ways to tell these stories in a science context. And I can provide some sort of resources for folks at the end who are looking to, to tell these stories. Um, this is a poem about the New Deal. Um, and then I'll, I'll, how are we doing on time? 6.40, I'll stop after this so that we have time for questions. Um, and then we can keep it going. In 1932, the Great Depression had taken America by the throat and rendered it an alchemy of dust and rations. The country had been decimated by a market that could no longer hold up a history of hypocrisy and it crashed like something that has never before known what it meant to fall. In response, Franklin D. Roosevelt signed a series of legislative acts designed to lift the country from its knees. The laws transformed the economy and are responsible for the foundation that created the contemporary middle class. In the 1930s, 75% of Southern black folks were either maids or farm workers. In the 1930s, the only workers who didn't qualify for the benefits of the New Deal were maids and farm workers. I was told you can only call something a coincidence if it wasn't done on purpose. A coincidence is texting with a friend and then running into them at the grocery store. A coincidence is showing up to the office in the same new shirt as your coworker. A coincidence is walking past a vending machine and finding some quarters in your pocket. Taking away all federal benefits from an entire demographic of people feels like we should call it something different, something a little more honest, something a little more empirically grounded. But see, the thing about racism in America is that if you don't call it racism, people think it isn't there. It's the shadow no one can see when it is standing right behind you. It's the carbon monoxide killing you in a room where there is no smoke. A million black folks end up in prison and people shrug and ask what happened. An unarmed man is shot by police when he is running in the opposite direction and people call it self-defense. Interstate highways are built through black communities and people suddenly can't explain why all the businesses have failed. If you take away social security, minimum wage protection, housing mortgages and healthcare, you don't get to then turn around, see poverty and act like you're surprised. How can you take the water from a fish tank and not expect the fish to suffocate, to gasp for its life, to flap violently against the surface while you watch from the other side of the glass? When a fish dies from having no water, do we call that a coincidence? If you block the sun from reaching a tree, do you have to ask why it doesn't grow? The government won't give you a loan to buy a house in a better neighborhood than they blame you when your son gets shot. The city never built a hospital on your side of town then they tell you it's your fault that the cancer spread. They stuff you into public housing then tear it down and ask why all the schools are empty. If we didn't say it directly, you can't blame us when it happens. If we continue to keep our eyes shut, it can't be our fault that we don't see you. But see, this country is only able to whisper the words American exceptionalism because we're so good at covering our ears while someone else is screaming. And I will stop there for now. Thank you so much, Clint. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Uh, we really just appreciate you sharing and just providing so much context both to the history um, but also to sort of these really really challenging questions that I think should really invite a lot of educators to sort of interrogate their practice and interrogate the ways in which um, they sort of have been taught to, to 
talk about history, uh, but also to even talk about how it, it, it impacts their work. 